Welcome everyone to day two of the Antitrust Division workshop on competition in television and in online advertising. Yesterday we heard opening remarks from the Antitrust Division's Assistant Attorney General Macon Delarahim, uh, who spoke about the division's long-standing interest in protecting competition in advertising markets. We also heard an insightful lecture from Professor Susan Athey, who taught us about the economics of advertising in all its forms. And we heard two lively and informative panels that led us through the nuts and bolts of advertising in television and in the digital space. We're about to hear two more panels, one on competitive dynamics and another on future trends in advertising. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. I expect it will be just as interesting and lively. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to the division's Lee Berger from our media, entertainment, and professional services section, who will lead panel three on competitive dynamics. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Lee Berger. I'm, as, I'm a trial attorney from the uh, Media, Entertainment, Professional Services Division. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of the recent television broadcast merger cases that we've had, as well as our conduct investigations in the television broadcast space. Uh, I'm also chair of the California Lawyers Association Antitrust UCL and Privacy Section. Uh, I thank our panelists for coming today. As we focus on a very important question about competition between television broadcasters, cable providers, and digital ad providers. A key question when a division analyzes a merger is the extent to which customers view products of the merging parties as substitutes for one another, relative to other products they might buy. When a merger would result in parties selling a set of products that customers would continue, consider to be close substitutes, the merger could give the parties the incentive and the ability to raise prices. In those cases, the division may seek divestitures to, or block a merger, a mer block a merger to, uh, to preserve competition and to maintain lower prices. In this panel, we're gonna talk about the extent to which advertisers consider broadcast spot advertising, NVPD spot advertising, and digital advertising as substitutes for one another in local advertising markets. Advertisers can and do choose to buy all three types of advertising, not to mention a whole host of other advertising services. But our inquiry into the merger does not stop there because we need to know whether the different types of advertising are, that are used are substitutable or complementary in purpose. Today, we'll address some of those questions that are needed to complete our analysis. I'd like to emphasize that we'll be talking on the panel today about local advertising, not national advertising, which is the potential market that we've been asked to look into when we're looking at television broadcast mergers. So for example, when we discuss broadcast spot advertising, we'll be concentrating on spots sold by local stations within a DMA, not national advertising sold by networks, uh, which are broadcast nationwide. So I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Uh, all the way to my left is uh, Dave Muji. He's the president and CEO of Tegna, the largest independent station group of major network affiliates in the top 25 markets, reaching approximately one-third of all television households nationwide. Under Mr. Muji's leadership, Tegna has been honored in recent years for its commitment to local investigative journalism and content innovation, with many national honors, including numerous Edward R. Murrow, Alfred I. DuPont, and George Foster Peabody Awards. Mr. Luigi is the immediate past joint board chairman of the National Association of Broadcasters. In 2015, he was inducted in the Broadcasters and Cable Hall of Fame. And in 2014, he was awarded the First Amendment Leadership Award by the Radio and Television Digital News Foundation. Uh, next to my left is Rick Kaplan. Rick is General Counsel and Executive Vice President, Legal and Regulatory Affairs of the National Association of Broadcasters. Mr. Kaplan is responsible for directing NAB's advocacy at the Federal Communications uh, Commission and other federal agencies. Before joining NAB, 
Mr. Kaplan held multiple leadership positions at the FCC, including Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Chief Counsel and Chairman Julius Janikowski, and Chief of Staff and Media Advisor to Commissioner Mignon uh, Clyburn. Mr. Kaplan also played a significant role in the FCC's review of major transactions brought before the agency during Chairman Janikowski's tenure, including Comcast NBCU, AT&T T-Mobile, AT&T Qualcomm, DISH, DBSD, and Terrastar, and Verizon Wireless Spectrum Co. and Cox. Uh, to my right is uh, Martin Jenks. Martin serves as President of Advertising for Comcast Cable. In this role, he's responsible for Comcast's portfolio of advertising assets. Previously, Mr. Jenks oversaw Comcast Cable's residential line of businesses, which includes Xfinity Video, Xfinity Internet, Xfinity Home, and Xfinity Voice, including strategy and development. Before joining Comcast, Mr. Jenks was an entrepreneur involved with a host of digital advertising and media syndication startups, including Grab Networks and Voxit. He also held a variety of leadership roles at AOL Inc., where he launched AOL's free web services, including the free AOL.com portal. Before AOL, Mr. Jenks worked as a consultant for McKenzie & Company in their media and telecom practice. Mr. Jenks holds an MBA from the Darden School at the University of Virginia and a BA in Economics and Political Science from New York University. And finally, all the way to my right is I, Ty Ahmed Taylor. He's Vice President of Business Product Marketing at Facebook. Mr. Ahmed Taylor leads Facebook's monetization strategy and global go-to-market efforts for products that connect people and businesses on the platform. Before Facebook, Mr. Ahmed Taylor served as CEO of THS X Limited, a global media and entertainment company. Mr. Ahmed Taylor brings to Facebook more than 25 years of information design, more than 20 years of consumer-facing software and product development leadership, along with interactive television services leadership. He has a diverse portfolio of technology and hardware patents, and has held roles at several startups and large media companies, including Viacom, Comcast, The New York Times, and Samsung. We thank our panelists for coming today. So I'm going to start by asking um, an opening question. Are cable spot advertising and digital advertising good substitutes for the advertising that advertisers buy on broadcast television. In answering this question, I ask each panelist to describe the products that they sell, what advertisers value most about the products that they sell, and what advertisers are hoping to achieve <coughs> by uh, buying their products, and uh, how the companies help meet those customers' goals. After we hear from each panelist, I'm going to ask the panelists a series of questions, and then we'll have time for the audience to ask their panelists questions as well. So, Ty, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm uh, super excited to be here, and I uh, got into town yesterday, and looking forward to being able to take, the, take part in the panel. Uh, we touched a little bit upon my background, uh, and so I think it sort of makes me uniquely uh, situated to speak on the panel. I've been a journalist working at the New York Times, which was a media distribution company. I've also worked at Comcast, uh, which is a global cable operator, MSO, as we know. I've worked at Viacom, which is a broadcaster, Samsung, which is uh, delivering television and uh, entertainment into your home over television sets. And now at Facebook, I'm interested in connecting uh, businesses to the people that matter most to them. Across all of that and all of the work that I've done, one of the things that's really stood out is the, is the notion of uh, getting return on ad spend. So, uh, as you came here today, whether you drove or, or caught the metro or caught the bus, you saw billboards, which is one way of uh, marketers reaching you. You also uh, perhaps were listening to the radio, so you had radio ads, and that's another way for them to reach you. You may have been watching the NBA playoffs last night, and there are ads there. That's another way for marketers to reach you. And you may have used one of the products in our portfolio, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp, and that's another way for marketers to uh, get their reach to you. All of that is really bound up in what we call and what I think the other panelists might uh, call by a different uh, name, but what we call the attention economy. Uh, and all of us here are part of the attention economy. You can pay attention to your children, you can pay attention to sports, you can pay attention to a newspaper or a magazine that you might read if you still have physical newspapers and magazines that you read. 
Uh, and all of that is, uh, all of those items are vying for your attention, and marketers and advertisers are also vying for your attention, and they're trying to find the touch points where they can get the greatest return on their spend to capture a portion of your attention. And so we have uh, something internally called the uh, KX funnel, and other marketers may just refer to it as the funnel. But basically, any marketer is trying to grow their business, and they do that by making you aware of the business, then making you consider that particular brand, and then the bottom of the funnel is really is what we call conversion, which is where you actually buy the service or product. And so to give you a practical example, if you're, say for example, the state tours and board for, this, for the state of South Carolina, and this is hypothetical, I don't know them personally, uh, you might want to make people aware of the fact that there's plenty of things to do that are interesting in South Carolina, and that would be the awareness layer. Then if you're a particular airline, that wants people to fly on your airline to South Carolina, you might say, hey, we're actually offering deals or trips to South Carolina, and that would be the consideration layer. Then the actual purchase of the ticket itself is conversion. And that can happen whether it's a, uh, a uh, half hour infomercial that you see late at night. It can happen if it's a newspaper ad that has a 1-800 number. It can happen if it's a digital property that then allows you to buy the ticket directly on the website or, or app that you're using. But all of these are competing with your attention through the funnel. And we and all of my uh, distinguished colleagues on the panel are competing for your attention across these points in the funnel on an equal basis. Some formats work better, like television is really quite good for top of the funnel and for consideration. And some of them are really good for the conversion component. But we're competing equally across all of the formats that we've discussed. And so uh, you know, we compete in, in, in the competition for, for advertising dollars at each stage of the funnel. Uh, we view that we are a likely substitute or a swap for both television, for print, for cable advertising, and for other types of media or billboards even that might compete for your attention. And brands can figure out if they're actually converting by looking at their efficacy across these different channels. And different channels, as I said, do different things. In the local Chicago market, for example, as I understand it, if a fast food restaurant does not advertise on an ongoing basis in the local Chicago market, they will see sales dip by 20%. And the reason that they're advertising on local television is because of awareness, like, oh, I'm hungry, I should go eat at that fast food restaurant. And again, that's, that's a type of brand or consideration and awareness advertising that takes place there. We may not be the best vehicle for that, but we're trying to compete to get those dollars as well. And so advertisers on the whole, when they're thinking about attention and the return on ad sale, they track their conversion and they track the attention, they attract the benefits and upsell and sales that they receive across each one of those channels. Uh, in the case with Facebook, and with Instagram and with WhatsApp, you can shut off your advertising with us at any moment. We're not, nobody's beholden to a long-term contract to spend money with us. So as a result, because of the immediate shutoff, we're, again, we're fiercely competing across all these channels through the vertical every single day to make sure that we're delivering value. Um, and you know, we, again, we hold our competitors in high esteem, but it is across each one of the channels that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Dari. Marcia? Um, Thank you for having me, and, and thanks to the Antitrust Division, the Department of Justice, for making, uh, allowing me to be on this panel, and thanks, Ty, for your comments as well. I'm going to do something similar. I'll talk a little bit about just what we do. Um, so um, I represent a group called Comcast Spotlight. Uh, Comcast Spotlight sells media at the local, regional, and national level for Comcast. Uh, we're also a rep firm. So we sell media for other people at the local, regional, and national level. And we sell a lot of digital. I think one of the things for everybody to understand is that um, there isn't such a thing called television over here and such another thing called digital over here, but rather we sell them both to a great degree, uh, both as substitutes for each other and as complements for each other. With that kind of as a little bit of background, um, there's obviously a lot of change in the marketplace and it's, uh, we see it as highly competitive with broadcast, cable, digital, uh, and other media uh, competing for a finite set of advertising dollars. And this is something else that I'll kind of point out. Um, total advertising spend in the marketplace uh, has over the course of the last 50 years grown at GDP. And so to the degree that somebody takes advertising dollars out of the marketplace, they're taking them from someone else uh, that kind of feeds this uh, competitive dynamic. 
uh, we feel that competitive pressure every day. There's three trends I want to hit on that I think will be relevant to the rest of the panel. Uh, the first, and I'm sorry, Lee, I think it's a mistake to view the so-called national advertising as somehow fundamentally different from regional and local advertising. In my view, it's inaccurate in today's marketplace uh, to draw hard and fast lines with these sorts of category definitions. Uh, the situation is much more fluid. Um, on the supply side, from an inventory perspective, it's the same inventory that sometimes we will sell in a national way, sometimes we'll sell it in a regional way, sometimes we'll sell it in a local way. But on the demand side too, advertisers weigh trade-offs um, in deciding which type of advertising they buy. They typically face one particular trade-off between effectiveness and cost. Uh, and by effectiveness, I mean how good is a particular media at reaching specifically the homes that you're trying to reach. And so there's a dynamic where, um, where everything else is equal, more targeted ads tend to be more expensive uh, on a per household or per impression basis, while less targeted ads tend to be less expensive. But two advertisers seeking to reach the same target audience may reach different judgments about how to balance the trade-off between price and waste. And so, just to make it real for everybody, um, as an example, an owner of several franchises uh, can choose to buy media regionally uh, in order to support those franchises. Uh, they might pay more on a per impression basis, but there's a lot less waste. Or they might choose to buy media nationally where but in, relatively speaking, they pay less for an impression, but there's more waste. Um, in our case, we see it all the time, where advertisers switch between local, regional, and national advertising, or to digital outlets, showing their substitutability. Um, the second trend I wanted to talk about is um, how the advertising market has really changed, and we see it every day, from content-based selling, so this is where people would sell a particular show or a network, to audience-based selling, where people are trying to reach a particular audience that's important for them to drive their business. This also has blurred the line between different types of media. Any platform that can be used to reach a particular audience is potentially a substitute for another platform, as Ty was saying, that reaches the same audiences. Any consumer that an advertiser might be trying to reach can be reached through a variety of different outlets. Broadcast, cable, websites, apps, uh, digital video platforms, and all sorts of other <coughs> kind of digital video or non-video uh, services. There's a really high overlap between all these media types. Um, only 14% of TV households are broadcast only. Um, and the substantial majority of those households are internet capable since 95% of all US residents live in a household with internet access. And so the ability to reach these audiences between different media types is, um, is quite high. Finally, um, advertisers, and this is something that Ty hit on, um, they've shifted focus away from I'm gonna buy this type of media or this type of media and they instead think about the return on their overall media spend and how spending on different types of media relates to uh, delivering the results that they're trying to achieve. Remember again, they have a fixed budget, right? So the, their budget doesn't expand whenever they wanna try something new. And within that budget, they're trying to optimize against the various options that they have. Billboards, radio, digital, TV, in its various uh, different forms in order to try to achieve their objective. And for any particular advertiser or any particular campaign, that mix can change. For all these reasons, I see advertising as a very broad and dynamic marketplace uh, where broadcast cable, digital, and other media all play a role and all compete with and place constraints upon one another. As a business person in this environment, I think it's essential to take a holistic perspective on the advertising ecosystem and not view different media within silos. I encourage the antitrust division to consider seriously this more realistic view of the marketplace. Thank you, Marcin. <coughs> Rick? Thank you, Lee. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
uh, and on behalf of the National Association of Broadcasters, I'd like to thank uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, Megan Delraheim, Lee, and the uh, whole antitrust division for putting on this uh, very important event. I thought the role I could fill on this panel here today is we have these experts who could talk about <coughs> the good points made already, and I'm sure Mr. Lujan will make some more. Uh, lining up for the conversation, um, broadcasters' view of the marketplace versus how DOJ sees the marketplace that might help frame some of the discussion and, and where some of the disconnect is from, from our view. Because few issues for us <clears throat> are more vexing uh, than how narrowly uh, the Department of Justice defines the video advertising marketplace. From our perspective, DOJ has the same view of the broadcast TV marketplace today as it did in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, never mind the cable and satellite providers now offer hundreds of channels of high quality content. And never mind that the internet has thoroughly upended the ways consumers access and engage with video offerings. And finally, never mind that if we pulled the first 100 people walking outside this building on the street to, to ask them whether or not they could distinguish between broadcast TV, cable, satellite, OTT video, we'd be lucky to probably find even just one. So where's the disconnect? Um, I thought, you know, today I'll look at a little bit of DOJ's view, how DOJ outlines uh, uh, in its complaints the things uh, when mergers come before it and compare it to where we are. DOJ typically uh, begins a number of its complaints in this area by noting that broadcast TV is unique because spot advertising combines sight, sound, and motion uh, in a way that makes television advertisements particularly memorable and impactful. <clears throat> of course, this premise, while certainly flattering, um, would be difficult for DOJ to prove in court. But even if it could, one would think that the same rationale would apply more broadly, as you heard earlier, uh, to cable, telco, and DBS advertisements. The DOJ to date has said no. Uh, while those are technically TV also, those alleged competitors don't count because TV stations have a greater reach than other platforms. But it's a little confusing because the term reach in this context is tricky. Uh, DOJ is not saying that the entire market watches uh, broadcast TV. Rather, rather, reach describes how many people can theoretically watch broadcast TV. And the relevance, therefore, of this metric somewhat escapes me because theoretical viewers don't sell spots or earn ad revenues. I'm sure Joe DiCipio sitting back there would love to do that. Uh, but only actual viewers uh, sell those spots. In fact, MVPDs, like Comcast, also reach nearly 100% of homes in most DMAs using that same definition. You can subscribe anywhere you like, just like you can purchase an antenna in most areas of the country and receive broadcast TV. So reach isn't really the issue. Um, but DOJ uses this notion of reported reach to argue that broadcast TV advertisements more effectively introduce and establish the image of a product. I think that's what Ty was uh, alluding to before. This is DOJ's way of suggesting that broadcast advertisements serve a different function than, say, maybe cable ads. If everyone in a DMA can see an ad, perhaps that's a good way to generate brand awareness. But again, DOJ conflates reach with viewers. DOJ never addresses the fact that only a very small percentage, even those highly watched broadcast TV programs, reach viewers in the first instance. And beyond this incongruity, DOJ's view is also noticeably lacking in support. What does it base this uh, social scientific claim? And also, why ignore other forms of advertising? I think Ty mentioned the attention economy. So wouldn't a guerrilla street marketing campaign do the same? How about a widespread local media buy on Google? Or what about naming rights to a local high school football stadium? Those all build brand awareness. Uh, and DOJ to date has ignored those uh, options that undoubtedly broaden the relevant marketplace. DOJ does get around to talking about actual viewership and claims that broadcast TV has superior ratings points. This statement, however, tells us nothing about who participates in the relevant product market from our standpoint. For advertisers, the bottom line is getting quality impressions at the best price. A highly rated TV program may be more expensive, if you think about the Super Bowl. However, since there's fierce competition in the marketplace, if that program is too expensive, advertisers can would and do reach the same number, if not more, people with a plethora of less expensive options. MVPDs and digital advertising alone offer seemingly endless cost-effective opportunities for advertisers. <clears throat> Speaking of digital, digital advertising on its own has completely changed the game. I think we've already heard some of the ways that that's happened. Digital takes things to a whole new level. It's ubiquitous, targeted, has very low barriers to entry, and it runs the same advertisements that broadcasters do. Unfortunately, today, DOJ has refused to budge even in the face of this digital revolution. Without missing a beat, DOJ has already repeatedly rejected requests to include digital in the broadcast TV marketplace, 
explaining that online ads can be skipped, minimized, or blocked. But I'm going to let everyone out a little secret. Mr. Luigi may be upset with me about this. But um, with broadcast TV, our version of skipping, minimizing, or blocking is grabbing a snack from the fridge, disappearing to the bathroom during a commercial break, or even just hitting fast forward on your DVR. In fact, in most cases, it's harder to do an end around uh, or a digital ad because often you can't even get to the highly desired content without first playing one or more advertisements. And so far, DOJ has failed to recognize what droves of advertisers have. Digital advertising can provide quality impressions less expensively because the targeting and tracking capabilities of digital ads make them more cost effective. After all, advertisers have limited and finite budgets and today can spend them on digital platforms targeting consumers they really want to reach. Hopefully, though, DOJ's decision to hold today's workshop suggests that it's finally poised to evolve from this somewhat antiquated view. We now live in a digital world, and broadcasters are certainly no exception. There is a very high cost to the American public if DOJ fails to update its broadcast TV market analysis, which is why this is so important. We can no longer operate in a bubble. With the dramatic decline of newspapers, broadcasters are one of the primary investors in local communities. Broadcasters take the public interest responsibility seriously, but local stations must compete successfully for ad revenue to meet their obligations and commitments to cities and towns across the nation. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Dave? Thank you, Lee. I want to thank you and Assistant Attorney General Del Raymond uh, for holding this panel on this important topic and inviting me to participate. Um, our company owns or operates 49 broadcast TV stations across the U.S., as well as a number of digital platforms. And as you stated in the intro, I recently served as a joint board chair of the National Association of Broadcasters. I've seen tremendous changes during my 30 plus years in the industry, and I'm pleased to be here to talk about some of them. We are talking about a very important topic and a very important time for the reason that Rick just mentioned in his conclusion. As the broadcast and other communication industries experience unprecedented rapid change, a proper understanding of the market dynamics in spot advertising is essential. An overly restrictive antitrust view continues to impede broadcast transactions, even as broadcasters' competitors for viewers and advertisers are rapidly increasing their already massive scale unimpeded by regulation. This administration has taken aim at overregulation. In the antitrust context, the Assistant Attorney General has explained that the division under his leadership will avoid substituting central decision making for the preferred free market while ensuring that transactions don't harm competition. A critical tool for doing so is accurate, updated, and forward looking understanding of the actual marketplace. In this case, the marketplace for local video advertising, as Lee wants to define it. We are not here, and I, at least I'm not here, to relitigate the past. As you know, many of my colleagues and I in the industry have believed for some time, and for the reasons that Marcian just went through in detail, that a mar modern market definition of spot advertising is broader than just over the air stations, and for a long time should have included large and sophisticated cable interconnects that provide local advertisers broad reach and inventory on nearly a hundred channels in a local market. But with the explosive growth of digital media, the local video advertising has, landscape has changed so fundamentally that those old debates are now largely beside the point. Simply put, high-speed broadband to the home and high-speed broadband to the phone has changed everything in the video marketplace. With the rise of 4G and unlimited data plans, every screen is a TV. To my 19-year-old son, a mobile phone like this is his TV. His viewing of over-the-air television stations in the past year can be counted in minutes, not hours. But like much of his generation, his viewing of long and short-form video programming on his mobile device can be counted in weeks. <laughs> True? And for some time now, those video consumption patterns no longer are restricted to younger consumers. Today, mobile broadband covers 99% of the US and approximately 87% of Americans own devices that can access mobile broadband. And of course, that number is growing by the day. And fixed, wired broadband to the home is now estimated at 82% and also growing. So think about it, you have a household with four people in the household, there's a broadband pipe that's wired and there's four more broadband pipes with each of their mobile devices. 
With the onset of ubiquitous high-speed internet service, there's been an explosion of platforms and applications with video advertising capabilities that consumers and advertisers have flocked to. Whether they're massive players like YouTube or Ty's company and Facebook, or a long tail of mobile applications and services that consumers value, with more being added every week. To the point of this hearing, I recognize none of that would matter to the, the guardrails of this hearing if all this valuable video content was not available to the local advertiser to reach their target customers with the same exact ads. But that's the critical change I want to emphasize today to the department. In just the last few years, this has been the most dramatic change. Today, they are available, and local advertisers are buying them en masse. As a result, there's no longer a question that these digital options aren't just complements, but substitutes for local advertisers. Let's look at it through the lens of a local advertiser and how he or she views their advertising options. As Marcian said, they have a fixed advertising budget. Their goal of that budget is to maximize the return on their advertising investment. It's worth noting that they have an enormous amount of effective options, more than ever, to reach their target customers beyond video ads, including direct mail, paid Google search, radio, etc. old and new options, more than they've ever had before. But with respect to their video advertising, they are targeting customers and audiences, as Marcian said, not programs. <coughs> they're, after, they're after their target customers and their audiences. They can buy from a local broadcast, they can buy from the cable connect, interconnect, and now a plethora of targeted digital options. For instance, they can go on to Facebook and, and Ty's company and through self-service place that same video ad against the very broad menu of targeted audiences of every generation and geography and things that, and, and, uh, and factors that they want to meet. The same identical dynamic holds true with YouTube. And based on Facebook and YouTube's annual visit video advertising revenue numbers and growth, it's undeniable how local ad dollars are flowing to those platforms out of fixed advertising budgets. But it goes far beyond Facebook and YouTube. At our own company, we've created a company called Premium that provides local advertisers the ability to place that same video ad inside high quality long form video programming like discovery programs and A&E on their own digital platforms as well as their distribution on a number of popular OTT services such as Sling or the Sony PlayStation. Through Premium, we reach consumers on their smartphones, their PCs, and their connected TVs. It's our fastest growing business for a reason. Because that's where consumers are going and the local ad dollars are following. Many of our competitors are now offering similar services. And there are numerous digital ad exchanges and demand side platforms that are av available to any local advertiser to reach their customer with highly sophisticated targeting with, again, the same video ad. The advertiser will assess the relative price offered for their video ad from each of broadcast, cable, and digital, and as Marcian said, the trade-offs involved relative to price and targeting, and buy any combination of all three, two, or one. It is one highly interchangeable video market now. So in other words, if broadcasters raise their prices, advertisers can, will, and do take their dollars elsewhere. Their customers, are now, are, their customers are on all three of these platforms and can be reached on each, but they're now all reachable on digital, with the small exception of a small percentage of Americans over the age of 55, like myself, who, sadly, advertisers don't covet. <laughs> In summary, advertisers over digital platforms now show ads that look exactly like traditional TV ads, over platforms that are growing viewership rapidly and enjoy extremely broad reach along with the ability to focus on particular locations or other characteristics. These ads are powerfully competitive with over-the-air broadcast ads in the local ad market and this competition only grows. It's about supply and demand. Supply is being added every day by these digital platforms. I hope you find this perspective useful, and I hope the division will consider these factors and analyses of future proposed transactions. I look forward to answering your questions and participating in today's discussion. Thank you. So I want to start by 
trying to zero in on what type of digital advertising we're talking about. This question is going to be for Kai and for Dave. So the question of market definition is not just about uh, whether different platforms compete in a general sense, but instead whether different platforms are close substitutes, close enough to prevent a price increase that would arise from a merger. Now, when we're talking about broadcast and cable spot advertisements, we talk about, uh, as Rick was referencing, a common format. Uh, they're short videos, typically 15 or 30 seconds. Uh, they combine sight, sound, and motion, and are generally seen as ideal for brand building. That is the, the top of the funnel that uh, Ty was referencing, rather than conversion, which is the bottom of the funnel. Digital advertising can come in various types of video, but also can be display ads that have some or no motion or no sound, or search term promotion, or other forms. When we are considering the question of whether digital advertising provides a good substitute for broadcast spot advertising, should we consider all digital advertising or just certain types of digital advertising? What types of digital advertising can provide the same functionality as broadcast spot ads? And do either of you believe that online digital advertising of all sorts, even advertising that's not tied to video content, competes in the same market with local uh, broadcast spot advertising? How do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, so what you're talking about is, is the format of their container and whether that dictates um, how the advertising is perceived and the value that it brings to bear. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, digital marketplaces, there are a bunch of brands that have sort of grown up in the digital space that do no advertising whatsoever in traditional television advertising. So uh, for example, there's a, a men's pants company uh, that sells exclusively, I'm not supposed to name anybody. Um, there's a men's <laughs> pants company that sells exclusively online. There's a way to get men's shavers uh, that was recently bought by Procter & Gamble that sells exclusively online. And then there's an eyeglass manufacturer um, that also sells exclusively online. Those brands have never engaged in the video space or traditional video space to drive their brand. They've built their brand through other channels and that's available to any advertiser, large or small. And so what we found is that the advertising experience has to match the user experience. And so by definition, if you're watching linear video that's not subscription-based, or even if it is subscription-based, the best ad format that's going to fit into that is more video. You're not going to put a static uh, ad in the middle of a, uh, of a TV show or commercial. That having been said, whether it's a 30-second spot or a 15-second spot, that same spot can run on our platforms or on Google's platforms as well, whether it's you, you, uh, to refer to YouTube um, uh, and other platforms of that sort, without being repurposed. What we found is that best practices dictate that you modify it slightly to fit the medium in which you're displaying it, but we take 30 second ads and 15 second ads and show those, um, to, you know, to use the exact precise uh, term, to the cows come home. Like, we're happy to do that. And so, um, you can use different ad formats, whether it's video or text or images or slightly animated images to, to, to achieve the same objectives, whether it's the top of the funnel, which again is awareness, uh, uh, consideration in the middle of the funnel, or, or to actual conversion. And you see that again with the late night spots that I mentioned before, which are the what, what we call in the industry infomercials. You may know them as infomercials as well. Those are actually just driving you directly to conversion because at the end, they can constantly broadcast a phone number or a website that you can go to or you actually convert. And so um, I think that they're both substitutes because you have to think about the scale that they offer. Uh, Dave mentioned sort of the, the scale and scope that's offered through broadcast television. And you see that same scale and scope offered in the digital realm. And so for advertisers who are considering the top of the funnel, which is what we traditionally would call brand building, they're just looking to capture people's, people's attention in a way that is re effective. And they can do that across multiple media using different formats that are germane to the media. But I would not conflate the, the, the media itself or the medium with the, with the advertising effectiveness. They're, they're independent, and you have to sort of uh, spend time where people spend time in the way and format that they're used to in that format. And so uh, you know, the equivalence in format is not the same as the effectiveness of the desired outcome. And that's what I'd leave you with. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so I would agree with um, a lot of what Ty said. He said it better than I could relative to, let's say, non just traditional video ads. But, uh, so I'll confine the answer to that I actually don't accept the premise that, just, that it's a, just a video advertising definition. But for the purpose of this panel, I will. But the, that it, it is absolutely, you know, 
it, television video advertising is not just about brand and awareness. Obviously, it does work well for brand and awareness, but it's conversion too. If an auto dealer is trying to move cars at the end of the month, they'll have ads on a Thursday and Friday that are conversion ads, and they will choose the medium that is the, perhaps the most successful. And I think you know, there's been. A, and I understand back to the early days of broadcasting, the you know when there's only four pipes channels coming to the house. That you know, the only way to reach those eyeballs were those were those you know those big four TV programs. But that has obviously changed dramatically with cable. And now let's just take and, and it was a later question, Lee, but just about the form of the programming. Long form doesn't necessarily mean higher quality to the advertiser. It quite quality impressions are quality impressions. Let me give you an example. Last week, if you're, an, if you're a basketball fan in Portland, Oregon. You know, their star guard did a 37-foot shot to win the seventh game of their, of their you know, seven-game finals. That was the, you know, the 30-second highlight on the ESPN app that night might have been the most invaluable engagement impressions available to an advertiser. <laughs> so having a local pre-roll on that ad, which local advertisers can on the ESPN app, is incredibly valuable content and impressions. So um, it just speaks to why the video ad place is becoming entirely a substitute now. Great, thanks, Steve. <clears throat> so next question uh, from Marcin and Rick. Uh, when thinking about cable spot advertising, uh, we generally think about it in two flavors. We think about DMA wide spots, and we think about uh, local zone spots. DMA wide spots reaching every cable customer or uh, MVPD customer in, uh, in the DMA, and a local zone uh, being more geographically targeted. If an advertiser seeks to reach the entire DMA, can a local zone cable spot be a good substitute for DMA-wide advertising? Are there digital products that can be targeted individually to a DMA? And if so, can those products be used to reach all households in the DMA, like a broadcast television spot, or to target subsets of the DMA, similar to a cable local zone ad? Marcin, do you want to start? Sure. Um, of course they're substitutes for each other. So, uh, you know, I covered this earlier. Uh, from our perspective, it's the same inventory that we sell at the DMA level or at the local level, so that I think by definition makes it a substitute. But then there's also the example I gave earlier about the trade-off between cost and efficiency, right? So if you are a local advertiser in a particular DMA, you can target ads closer to where your stores are and pay more for those ads and get a little bit less waste, or you can target across an entire DMA and take the other side of that trade-off, and this happens literally every day. I'm gonna give you kind of a, a very real example. So we work with a, um, an auto advertiser uh, who had a single location in a DMA and did a lot of zone advertising around that location. They then added a second location, different part of the city, and so their natural initial uh, reaction was, let me go and advertise at the DMA level. But what they realized is that most of their um, customers were coming from particular zip codes within that DMA and so then they made the trade-off to go back to a multiple zone advertising in order to attract in the most efficient way for them the audience that they were trying to reach. It's literally the same thing just configured in slightly different ways and making different trade-offs all trying to optimize against ROI and the two are very much interchangeable in the advertisers eyes and that we see that every day. So then let me hit on the second thing, which is the digital, can you target a, a digital ad at the DMA or sub-DMA level? And the answer is, of course you can, which is, again, why that is a total substitute to uh, the same products that we have in the marketplace today. And we uh, use, do that ourselves. Similar to Tegna, we have products in the marketplace that are entirely digital which sometimes our customers will buy as a substitute to traditional television and sometimes it's bought as a complement to get incremental reach on, on uh, a particular or other buy that they've done. The ability to reach these audiences across all of these different kind of cuts of the media um, is very fungible um, and we see them travel back and forth between them all the time. Great. 
Well, I, I mean, I agree completely. I mean, that's that's how advertising works, and I think this gets back to my opening statement, which <clears throat> is this um, illusory concept of reach. It doesn't matter who if that broadcaster or if broadcasters have a big stick in a market, and they send the signal out. But what Marcian's talking about is folks are looking for and advertisers are looking for who are they actually going to reach? Who's watching? Where are they watching? What are they interested in? So the notion that you could blast out a signal far and wide doesn't actually do anything on its own. Uh, and this is why they're substitutes. So as Marcian said, uh, cable is, obvi is, is a head of broadcast and that it's able to kind of switch between these two. Broadcast is actually working to catch up, if anything. So in fact, not the market leader here, in fact, looking to try and duplicate that because they're able to, cable in this case, is able to target or do DMA wide if, if they want. So if they want this broad reach to try and throw it out there so you get it, that's one thing. But that's not really where advertisers are going. We've heard that, I think, from each panelist to this point. They're looking for more data. What can we learn? And that's actually where the digital question, Lee, that you asked come, comes in. And that's where, you know, Ty's company, they're able to learn a lot more, a lot more quickly about uh, the folks that advertisers are trying to reach. They're, future customers and put those ads, those video ads that Dave talked about, right next to um, the thing that you're, you happen to be looking at that day that might be relevant to you and the ad can be targeted to that. So that's what people are looking at, not this generalized notion of reach that you can theoretically get to a number of people, but they're looking at what they demand of Dave's company and all my member companies is what are you delivering? What's the return on investment that uh, Marcian mentioned? And, and they are, that's why they, they're going to look for, if, if you can't deliver it at the end of the day, if, if, the, if the TV uh, spot can't, then they're going to go over to the cable interconnect or they're going to go over to Facebook. And, and Rick, just to follow up on that. So when the salespeople uh, at the companies are selling, at, at the broadcaster companies are selling their product, uh, they're telling the uh, advertisers that uh, I have a rating which is based on the reach of my product and the amount of uh, the number of people that are calculated to have seen it based on the reach of the station. Uh, so isn't that the product that's being sold by the broadcasters? Or Dave, do you want to? Yeah, why don't I take one? I, every uh, every platform is going to try to sell the merits of its platform. I'm sure Marcian salespeople are saying every day about how much more targeting they have and frankly how much more reach they have. So what your records may show about what salespeople are trying to sell about their uh, particular enterprise, they're salespeople, okay? But I know your next, your next question is on reach, which, back to Rick's point, of, is it's a very different story. Yes, uh, so, and, and, yeah, and I agree with Dave that, that um, yes, you just described what a salesperson tries to do to make the best case for what they're trying to sell. And, uh, but the reality of what they know is they're going to say, hey, this is the ratings, this is the cost uh, based on those ratings. But the reality is they know that if they drive that cost up too high, there's plenty of other places for the advertiser to go. So, so the formula is correct. So now we've moved from reach to ratings, which is act what I would call actual reach, which you're, you're correct in pointing out. But, but that's, again, that doesn't speak to whether it's a substitute or not, because at the end of the day, if, that, if, if, um, if that's not appropriately uh, priced and it's too expensive, then they're just going to go down the street to the competitors. Uh, all of these involve trade-offs, as we right. talked about before, between the value that you deliver and the cost that are around it, and they are all substitutes for each other. Well, so let's let, let's talk about the question of reach within a uh, within a market, and this is a question for to start with for Dave and Marcin. So, uh, if an advertiser wants to reach an entire DNA. The broadcaster spot can generally reach all households in a, an entire DNA. But an MVPD's reach within a DMA varies. Uh, in virtually all cases, having fewer households that it, uh, the MVPD touches than the broadcaster. Even when they're operating through an interconnect and they, through the interconnect, bring together a number of uh, MVPDs, they still don't have the total reach of a broadcast station within a particular DMA. So how does the difference in reach of broadcasters and cable advertisers uh, affect how advertisers view them as substitutes? Can cable spots provide advertiser customers with comparable products as broadcast spots, given that difference in reach? And does cord cutting and cord shaving increase in cable programming penetration uh, within a DMA, it decreases. Does that render cable spot advertising less competitive with broadcast spot advertising? Uh, and 
Uh, Dave, do you want to start this one? Yeah, sure. I'll start with. I think that I think I'm going to go back to Rick's point. I think there's a very misused word of the use of the word reach. There's a there's a theoretical point that a household could turn on our channel. Okay, just like Marcian system goes by every house that they could theoretically sign up for. Just because the, my channel reaches a household doesn't mean it ever watches it. Okay, and in fact, just to, just deal with just cable before we talk about digital. Some of these interconnects, I think, in our market, they average around seventy-four percent. I think Marcian, with your cable plus here in the DC market, tell me if I'm wrong. You promote, you reach ninety-two percent of the market. That's right. Right. None of our stations come close to, re, you know, re, you know, ever having ninety-two percent reach. And when you look at it on a ratings basis, okay, which is the way to look at it, right? So Marcian's running, you know, spots on the hour on ninety-plus channels. The aggregate rating points, and that hence the people reached, right? Um, and and added to the, the Nielsen's definition of reach, the. All the broadcasters in the market, in these major markets, don't reach more consumers than his systems do. Okay? So, yes, our salespeople do go sell reach, but they're, the more progressive companies now, we're selling a lot more than that. We're trying to move the customer's eyeballs, and we don't go in just with selling our television station. We're selling these digital projects, our, our own, and reach extensions, and reach extensions and the like. And I think you're asking the question, too, is about now can... Can, can cable sort of replace that reach with an interconnect and so and the answer is yes. Ad exchanges can reach, with IP addresses, can reach everybody. Um, so that to Marcy and, and Ty's earlier points, it, it, you know, it, you, the advertiser doesn't want to reach the whole DMA, Lee. They want to reach the people they want to reach, right? And so they may put more value if they're an auto, let's say they're, they're a tier two auto association, they might put more value on putting 30, targeting 30,000 people who are clearly auto intenders than 80,000 people that's just a broad shotgun. I, I mean, I agree. I, um, it's, maybe what I can do here is just, let me provide an example. So, so you're right, a simple cable system uh, it may sound like it's disadvantaged from a reach perspective, but as you have said, we do the interconnects and that gets us closer. But then just to say something on actual viewership, 70% of actual viewership for somebody that has access to both cable networks and broadcast happens on cable networks. By comparison, 25% happens on broadcast. Um, and what we do is we aggregate audiences across all the 60 plus or 100 plus networks that we insert in. So if a relative rating is smaller, it doesn't matter because you can stitch up ads that exist across all different types of cable audiences to reach the folks that you're trying to reach. So here's the example. Advertiser comes to us and says, I can go to the CBS local broadcaster and reach, I'm gonna to go to actual numbers, so, uh, 208,008 people <coughs> that I'm targeting, right? So it's not even just any people, it's the folks that I'm trying to go out and reach. And I can go to the a ABC affiliate and I can reach 218,474 people. I can put that advertiser across 20 cable networks and allow them to reach 237,031 people. And we do this every day. And the same applies not just within kind of the television environment, but also in the digital environment. You can go out and even if you don't manufacture it yourself, you can go out and buy ad avails in the open market to piece together an audience of this size in any given DMA. I mean, that's just the way it works. Thank you. So next question for uh, Rick and for Ty. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the actual qu uh, quantity of uh, ad-supported cable and digital video that's available. <coughs> so I want you to assume for the purpose of this question that advertisers consider DMA-wide cable spots and DMA-wide digital advertising to, uh, that's attached to high-quality, long-form video to be good substitutes for broadcast spots. Some data analyses have suggested that about 80% of video viewing uh, is through traditional TV, broadcast, and MVPD, either live or time shift. 
leaving about 20% for TV-connected devices, smartphones, PCs, and tablets. A lot of that 20% is accounted for by Netflix and Amazon Prime, which doesn't have advertising. Much of what's left is consisted of short-form YouTube videos, which does not have the same appeal for advertisers as long-form products on television. How much high-quality digital advertising inventory is actually available as compared to broadcast and cable advertising? And is most of that inventory fragmented across sellers, making it hard to execute a buy with broad reach in a particular DMA? Is there sufficient inventory of additional DMA-wide cable spot advertising or DMA-wide high-quality long-form digital advertising to provide a realistic alternative to the needs of more than a small number of advertisers who are currently purchasing broadcast spots. And then also for Ty, Facebook has recently introduced Showcase, its new premium video ad program. How products like Showcase affect the current lack of digital advertising inventory attached to high quality long form video? Ty, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I unfortunately have to go back and reinvoke the notion of an attention economy, which is essentially that. Uh, the choices that advertisers make are not binary with regards to whether am I going to do the digital video or am I going to would I do broadcast video or, or or cable video. They're more influenced by their ability to achieve their objectives across the funnel, whether it's awareness, consideration, or conversion, and that's irrespective of the format that delivers those results. And what we found, and I'm sure Marcin would say the same, is that the most sophisticated advertisers are moving to actually measuring outcomes. Did the person buy my product or service? And that's a trend that we're going to see accelerate over time. And that's on the advertising side of the industry. On the media side of the industry, none of these things are binary. While some things may not be perfect substitutes, what you find is that people never flock individually to a single art form. So historically, when radio existed and TV was coming on the scene, people were like, oh, that's going to destroy radio. And I think that we all still listen to a lot of radio. And then when uh, uh, satellite radio came about, you know, that was also a threat to terrestrial radio. And it turns out that both are still flourishing. And with radio and with television and with billboards and with the digital advertising market, all of these media exist overall. And I now have the great opportunity to invoke Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But from a consumer perspective, what they're really interested in is, can I be entertained? And so entertainment can come across multiple forms and multiple touch points. Marketers are leveraging the consumer desire to be entertained to get their marketing message across. And that's, again, irrespective of medium and more closely tied to the objective that takes place. And so one of the things that uh, uh, advertisers are looking for is they look at understanding the reach that they have across formats is a product that Nielsen has, which is total audience rating points, which includes not just broadcast, not just cable, but also the digital marketplace as a single rating system to understand things that occur on our platforms, on Google's platforms, digital ad services, on broadcast platforms, and on cable platforms, so they understand the efficacy of their total spend. And that number is a super important number because it does show you the total reach and how you're reaching folks. But more importantly, it suggests that people are being entertained across all of them because there's an equivalent number that we can use to assess, to assess all of those platforms through a single lens. I think that's valuable to know and to understand. With regards to showcase, uh, for companies that are growing in their sophistication with regards to their ad techniques, they still need an on-ramp, if you will, or, or a gateway product to fully be fully immersed in, in digital ad buying techniques. So Showcase mimics the buying uh, process that many advertisers and marketers use with traditional cable and broadcast television, and then drops it into a digital realm using some of our long form video so that they buy it in the same way that they would buy traditional television uh, or, or cable, uh, cable television. And so it's just making, uh, it's creating a more facile interface for traditional marketers to be able to buy our products, and we do that as a gateway product to getting them to more fully consider outcomes, which is what the entire industry is trying to do. Yeah, and just picking up on that last point, uh, the question about the, uh, the fragmented nature, uh, potentially, of the digital realm, and I think Marcin talked about this. Um, people figure it out, so Facebook is saying it's in their interest, right, to, to make it as easy as possible. So. Yes, if I tried to figure out on my own, but that's not the way it works, right? So you, if you go to the cable interconnect, they'll piece together what you're looking for for you to have that reach. Same thing with Facebook. They're developing products too. You go as you want to advertise, okay, this is how you reach these people. These are the outcomes you're looking for, and we'll find that. So the, the fragmentation does not 
uh, impact the advertiser. It's just a problem to solve for, in this case, Facebook or for the cable interconnect. And they do it because it's in their interest, and that's why you can go and figure out. And, and frankly, it, it's, it's, it's um, really telling uh, a lot of this conversation, especially when we talk about the digital side, but even the very mature industry of the cable side, of the amount of targeting that goes on. And so, in fact, it's kind of flips the DMA reach uh, concept on its head because where the ball is moving and where the dollars are moving is all to how much you can target, where you can go. And those are things, again, if you look at the actions of broadcasters, we're trying to catch up there. That, that's, that's where we're trying to go because that's where, um, that's where these folks are able to deliver this value. And the fragmented nature is not, is not uh, a, a limiting factor on them. Thanks, Rick. All right, next question is for uh, Dave and Marcian. A key factor that advertisers uh, think about when choosing platforms in which to advertise is the number of viewers of the programs to which the advertising is attached. In television, this is often measured by ratings. Broadcast television typically has most of the highest rated programming shown on television, major sporting events, local news, and primetime television. These higher ratings are so substantial that in the evaluation of station combinations, the FCC differentiates between top four stations and uh, lesser stations, uh, having a top four rule, which usually applies to uh, affiliates of big four networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. On the other hand, some cable networks occasionally show highly rated shows, Walking Dead on AMC, <coughs> certain sporting events on ESPN, or regional sports networks, uh, and other examples. These highly rated shows often make up a small percentage of the overall programming on those cable networks, and usually are only included in one or two of the top 100 uh, programs shown on television. Looking at the ratings broken down by demographics, broadcast television tends to have more highly rated programs across a broad demographic reach, while cable programs and digital content tend to have smaller audiences and appeal to narrower demographics. How do the ratings of broadcast television and cable television programs affect advertisers' willingness to substitute a cable spot for a broadcast spot? For example, in, is a broadcast spot with a 5 rating better than 25 cable spots with a 0.2 rating because of duplication and excess frequency? Is there any internet program that features digital ads that obtain audiences that are comparable in reach to broadcast programs? And how, do, how does audience size of digital ads affect advertisers' willingness to substitute digital ads for broadcast spots? Dave, do you want to start? Yeah, Lee, I really appreciate the question because I actually think the premise of the question is the falsehood under which the current um, regime, uh, on which the current DOJ rules are being based. As I said earlier, and Marcian said, advertisers are buying audiences. And it's true on a national level that, that in fact, that the TV industry, the broadcast industry puts it out, talk about the highest rated programs. That's not actually always true on the local level. But I can guarantee you last week that, that our ill fitted gave seven of the caps was one of the highest rated programs in the marketplace, right? And it's, and in fact, other than the NFL, almost all highly rated local sports is only available on cable. So there's just, that premise also doesn't hold true. But more importantly, to the point, it's no longer about buying programs. It's about buy, aggregating audiences in environments and impressions. So, so when you talk, my, my, highly rate, my highest registration station, I won't name the market, can walk, will walk into an advertiser and talk and, and, and have that conversation around reach. That, that, that salesperson does not have the reach that Marcy and salesperson has in the same market. Because when they walk in, they are, as he said, he's selling 85, 95 chan cable channels that are, they're not, they're not like a different universe of people. They're all the same type of demographics that the advertiser is trying to reach, but they're able to target that across multiple channels and aggregate those rating points, which are impressions. So I, I do appreciate the question, because once upon a time, in the early days when there were just four broadcast networks, you bought programs. But quite some time ago, the advertiser moved away from that, and now they're buying impressions. And so it just, the, it, the answer is it, is it has just fundamentally changed. 
mean, look, I can go through my example again, but it's the same example, so I, I'll spare everybody. <laughs> uh, remember, 70% of the viewership happens within cable networks compared to 25 across broadcast. That's fairly consistent. There was something in the question about the cable reach is somehow not unduplicated. That's not the way we look at it. We know who looks at what, and we can deliver to an audience an unduplicated reach across multiple networks. You might not find this person on this network, but you might find them over there. When you aggregate it together, you can deliver the higher numbers. So let me actually focus on the second part of the question, which is the digital aspect of it. There was some element uh, that you said, Lee, around, you know, does a single digital ad, can it have the same reach as a television ad? Um, a single digital ad is a single impression. Television ads historically have been buckets of impressions. And so it's comparing apples and oranges to some degree. Can somebody who has a single digital ad add to it another 250,000 single individual ads and capture as big of an audience? Of course they can, and that's the way that it works. That's why you can reach broad audiences across a digital format. It happens every day on multiple platforms, by the way, including ours and including Dave's. Um, so then there's, there's another kind of interesting intricacy that's come up a couple times about increasingly television can also target. And so there is a growing capability, not just to target television by zone, but target it in other ways that breaks up this kind of ubiquitous bucket of impressions that a television spot delivers into individual impressions. And that is happening too. Um, and that's significant because historically, Ty has said a number of times, you look at the funnel, everybody competes at every part of the funnel, maybe different um, methods lend themselves better to one type of the funnel than, uh, than the other. And it is too that historically, or I would say in the past, television might have lent itself better to the top of the funnel because it was harder to break up the impressions. The reality is that today, and, and even with things like the, um, you know, QVC or the, the, you know, the, the programs that are selling you stuff late at night with, with the 800 number, the challenge with them was always that they were broad reach, not targeted. We now have the ability to target. Um, and so the, this idea of you buy a bunch of impressions in a bucket or you buy an individual impression is totally broken down because you can buy that individual impression a whole bunch of different times so that they look like the bucket and you can also now buy the bucket split up in different ways so that it looks like the individual impressions. So the distinction doesn't make any sense. All right, let's talk about content. And, and Ty and Rick, this is a question for you. So <coughs> digital cable and broadcast each have some unique types of content that the counterpart from the other platforms do not have. For example, broadcast television has local news. Digital platforms have social media sites in which users interact directly with their friends and often advertisers. Cable networks offer specialized programming that may appeal to narrow demographics with loyal followers. Indeed, the salespersons uh, from all three platforms often tell the superiority and uniqueness of their content when pitching their advertising products. How does the uniqueness of some of this content affect advertisers' willingness to substitute between the different platforms? And uh, Rick, why don't we start with you today? Sure. Um, well, I think, uh, again, <coughs> as a lot of this conversation has uh, centered around Dave, as mentioned before, the conversation today is different than it would have been 15 or 20 years ago, or maybe even 10 years ago, because the silos that uh, you refer to about unique content have broken down themselves. And you can take the, all the different categories you mentioned, whether it's, whether it's news, um, a substantial percentage of people get their local news now online that competes with broadcasters. And there's, no, there's nothing about broadcast local news that, that makes it their own domain that no one else can compete with. Broadcasters see that as a public service. They invest heavily in it because they think that's their way they can connect to their community. But all along the way, especially with digital, and we have someone cable too, there's lots of opportunities for local news. And Pew has put out a number of numbers that talk about the rise in local news on uh, different digital platforms. Sports, Dave talked about sports, whereas one time you'd flip on you know, one of the four networks and you get all the sports you wanted. 
now the, the competition for sports is so fierce. There's no, there's no one corners the market. You can even look at the um, NCAA, you know, finals for basketball. You know, it's gone back and forth between cable and broadcast. So those things are now. There's no more cornering of the market in anything. And almost all local sports are on cable. That's right. And most local. That's a that's a that's a terrific point. And entertainment is maybe even the best example of all because you look at. Um, and again, this is a new development, so DOJ couldn't have accounted for this in the past, but certainly can now. Netflix and Amazon producing their own content that's highly valuable and highly watched that competes directly. And in fact, for broadcasters, one of the challenges we have is, um, for our FCC friends in the room, we have rules that, that don't allow us to show most of the shows that win all the awards when you go to the Emmys uh, because of the you know, decency obligations we have. Um, the Marcian's, uh, Marcian's very indecent. Um, so, Wait a second. I'm not going to talk about this. Yeah. Um, so, so, it's, so these things are, are, again, these are older notions that, that perhaps made sense in the past, but there's no way when you look at the jumble and the way these things are interchangeable, and, and it makes sense because these platforms, so Marcian's, Ties, are, are trying to compete in these areas and, and, and have done really well at producing the things that maybe at one time broadcasters had an advantage of, but certainly today, uh, and that's why my first example, if we went outside and asked people, is this a broadcast station or not? What are you watching it on? They'll have no idea because those barriers have all been broken down. Hi. I'd say the same thing, that the, the, the format doesn't dictate the objective and the two are, are highly separated. And so um, if a company believes that it does better by advertising on rom-coms, like, I, I don't think that any company thinks that way. I think the inverse is true, which is that there's no company that doesn't advertise broadly across all of the channels and silos that we're talking about to reach customers in different ways to achieve different objectives. But there's no, um, I don't think there's a predisposition because of the type of interactions that occur outside of advertising to view or to favor one or the other. It's really what is the objective and how effective is my turn on ad spend is the, is the primary lens. Uh, just to interject for a second. I know yesterday part of the conversation was around quality and does quality make a difference that's kind of disqualifying or another. My perspective even on quality is that it's part of this cost effectiveness trade off. If you can do something where you're maybe taking more brand risk, but it costs you half as much, maybe you're willing to do that, or some advertiser is and another one isn't. These things are all very interrelated. Great. So I want to ask a question to Dave and to Rick about Miller Kaplan. So broadcast stations regularly take part in a data survey from Miller Kaplan, in which Miller Kaplan gathers each station's spot advertising sales revenue in the DMA for the past quarter, and then aggregates the data and uh, reports on the state of the market to the broadcasters. Uh, Miller Kaplan's reports even show that the total spot advertising revenue for the broadcast station makes up 100% of the market. Cable spot advertising revenue and digital re advertising revenue is not collected or reported in those reports. The broadcast stations rely on Miller Kaplan reports uh, in budgeting, in price setting, evaluating performance, among other things. What kinds of quarterly data do your companies collect about the advertising sales from the other two platforms? And how do you use it? If broadcast spot advertising, cable spot advertising, and digital advertising are all in the same market, why don't all three platforms participate in the same kind of data gathering and aggregation analysis that Kip, uh, Miller Kaplan offers? If cable spot advertising and digital spot advertising are in the same market as broadcast advertising, how is the Miller-Kaplan analysis, which presents only a part of the competitive landscape, useful to broadcast stations, and why do they rely on it? The answer is it's not very useful. It's a legacy habit of the past um, that broadcasters always in, 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 in pull that data together, and for all the reasons we talk about today, it's pretty much not that meaningful, and it's not useful at all for pricing, for reasons I can go into if you would like. Um, but you're right, we would love to have Marcian's data, but typically the interconnects have not wanted to participate, and God knows, I don't know how, for the reasons we talked about today, we would ever, anybody would ever get a hold of the digital data right now, but we, we would love to have that information. Um, but you're absolutely right, because we're going after a far much larger addressable market, but it's the only still legacy audit that's in place, and it does have the wrong unintended consequences, because it can have you know, broadcast salespeople and general managers sort of focused on the wrong things, but it's still used as a guide. Okay, here's what the broadcast market's doing, trying to budget for the station going forward, but it absolutely would be far better for us to have all the data from the other platforms. It's just not available. 
and we do, and I'm in the, excuse me, your question, uh, Lee, I mean, there are, uh, you know, other different uh, digital, you know, com score and uh, other things out there, but there's no real, um, real, real, real qualified quantity service that we can rely on, and same true, and same uh, true with Marcian's business. Yeah, and to me, that's that's the bottom line. As broadcasters work with what they have, uh, at the end of the day, Miller Kaplan, I'm sure, would love to get the data from digital and cable. And in some markets, some very small percentage of markets, they do, but typically they don't. And broadcasters are looking for some way, some as a message, but some way to evaluate performance, some way to look at something. In the absence of data, there's no way to get that. Uh, it's voluntary, so broadcasters participate voluntarily. And it would go the same for digital and cable. So, you know, I know that division has used that as an aha moment. Oh, broadcasters only compete with broadcasters. Your own documents say those very things. It would be a bad consequence in some ways if then broadcasters say, okay, well, I'm not even going to do that now because it's going to be used against me, um, which I don't think is the right outcome and certainly not what the division is looking for because <laughs> broadcasters are just, again, using what's available. And there's a number of different services, you know, Nielsen, Media Monitors, SNL Kagan, BIA. A lot of those are bright estimates, again, too, which, you know, you can make of it what you want. Yep. And Dave, Dave could talk about how useful that is. Lee, I'll give you, I think, what's something that's an exact analogy, right? So the, our broadcast network partners, a couple of them are in the room here today. When you go to their, we go to their meetings with them, they are laser focused on how they're doing against the other broadcast networks, right? We're up, at, we're up a tenth of a point in the mornings over the other guy, and they are, you could, you know, so the division could, the same theory of the case, take that data and say, oh, they're only competing against themselves. You think they want the Netflix data, right? <laughs> <laughs> the point, the, I mean, the point, I don't mean it facetiously, the point is Netflix is that now they're a massive competitor and they would certainly want that data, but all they have, since all they have is what the other broadcast guys are doing, then they end up focusing on what they know. If this is helpful, just to illustrate, we look at our Kaplan data because we compete with you, and it's useful for us to see it. And I'd love to see Grant's data too, if only he would make it available to me too. <laughs> well, so, Marcin, if if that data uh, would be useful to an interconnect in the same way that the broadcast receipt is useful, why doesn't? The, why don't well, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't like sharing my data with other people. <laughs> I like seeing other people's data, <laughs> which helps me compete the, better against them. He's trying them. to bring us together. Just, 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 to be, just to be super clear about it, it's not totally clear to me why the broadcasters all <laughs> pile their data into a pile that we can all look at it. I'm glad that they do. <laughs> um, and I wish other people did, too. Um, but, you know, if I, I, I see no reason to disclose any more than I do. Actually, that habit, may, that habit may be dying a death today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, so uh, one more question before we get to the uh, audience questions here. Uh, and Dave, this is for you. I, you know, we often look at what's known as the hypothetical monopolist test. So the question, essentially, for the hypothetical monopolist test goes this. If in a particular DMA, there were a single seller of all broadcast television spot ads, would that seller be able to profitably increase price for some of its spots by 5% beyond where uh, the prices are today? Similarly, if there were a single seller of all digital ads, that could sell, could that seller increase price by 5% beyond what prices are today? And in each case, what would prevent a single seller from raising those prices by 5%? Where would the advertiser substitute to, to avoid that unprofitable increase in price? Well, I don't like hypotheticals, Lee, and I'm not gonna speak to a hypothetical for the digital side of the business, but just simply put, you know, I'm confident for the reasons we've discussed today that broadcast stations would not have the power to raise prices on spots, even under that hypothetical, because all of the fierce competition from digital advertising we discussed today. So the simple answer is no. Okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it takes much time. Anyone else want to comment on that? Just very briefly, sure. most digital ad, au ad auctions are based upon an, uh, are based upon the, the perception or the, the actual auction mechanics that you pay one penny more than your next closest competitor is bidding. So we don't have actually the opportunity to, to raise rates by five percent unilaterally. It's not a. It's a. There's a. It's an auction dynamic that's determined by the efficiencies of the market. And so our goal is basically is, is efficiency on the return on ad spend and making sure that we're a viable platform. And I think ultimately all of the platforms that are here are looking to do the same thing. Yeah, the thing our advertisers just to go back to real life examples ask us for the most is 
some data so that they can calculate the return on their media spent. Yeah. If anybody in the, that we talked about significantly raises their cost of their media, the return by definition goes down, and that's going to make them less competitive relative to their other choices. Literally, that's the biggest focus that any advertiser will tell you in the marketplace right now. They're they're trying to achieve get an ROI on their media spend. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask our panelists, I uh, just please raise your hand and we can uh, take questions. Should I get a little mic or should I just stand up? Uh, yeah, stand up. Uh, I, I'm, I will repeat the question so that folks who are listening uh, in the overflow room can hear it. Uh, yeah, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Uh, Mr. Berger, I was wondering, did you know going in that everyone on this panel would agree with each other the entire time? <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you pick this panel, or who did pick this panel? Uh, so the question was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who picked the panel, and uh, did we know that uh, people would be coming from similar perspectives? Uh, I picked the panel. I, the uh, did, did we? I have an inkling that people would be coming from the same perspective. Yes. I, I, we have dealt with all, all of these industries for a while, and I, so we had an inkling that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I, I will uh, sit so we have just a few minutes left. I'm going to ask Ty uh, one question. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you about the Marcy Inspire Award. Uh, it's a very popular award that people have given to companies that have been doing great work. Through Marcy's business, the uh, cable companies expand their reach within a DMA by uh, working together through an interconnect. Uh, is there any similar phenomenon like an interconnect in the uh, online advertising space, or do you see one emerging, if not? Uh, we have a product called the Audience Network, where we provide the opportunity to, through our ads interface, to buy uh, impressions, reach, and conversion opportunities through third-party publishers who choose us as an advertising supply provider because we're giving them a higher rates than what they're able to achieve on their own network. And so we, there, we have a distributed network that operates in, in, in a, I wouldn't say exactly the same as an interconnect, but has uh, much of the same benefits for both marketers and for advertisers. By I'm sorry, way, marketers and distributors, excuse me. By the way, we do that too. We sell digital advertising, we aggregate uh, digital advertising from lots of sources, not just ourselves, to create a broader reach uh, for our customers. So that same mechanism of trying to achieve the same value proposition in the market certainly exists because we do it every day. Great. All right. Uh, hearing no other questions, last chance. All right. Uh, thank you to our panelists today. We really appreciate it. And I thank you.